Previously, we learned that because of a divine miracle, a million Excaliburs started spawning in the past. Each Excalibur bestows great strength and the title of Arthur to its wielder. So that's a million Arthurs running around. To bring balance to the Force, six Arthurs must destroy every Excalibur distorting history. Dancho, the leader, Tekken, a gauntlet-wielding, high-spirited young man, Yamaneko, an unsociable girl with a rocket launcher, Renkin, a tiny girl with a huge mallet, Kaka, a smart boy wielding a magician spellbook, and Ruro, a young man with twin firearms. Yes, it's these six versus one million. As the leader, Dancho must prove to her comrades that she deserves her role. So far, they've crossed out more than 10,000 Excaliburs, a little over 1% of their goal. It's not much, but it's something. Plus, going on missions as pairs has helped the squad members grow closer. This camaraderie is important because, despite their enormous strength, they'll need to work together to eliminate their 1 million targets successfully. One peaceful early morning, Dancho surprises the squad with Japanese cuisine for breakfast. Tekken is the most enthusiastic of the bunch as always, while Kaka is suspicious of the strange food on the appetizer plate. Renkin informs them it's takuan or yellow pickled daikon radish. Surely something so weird smelling can't taste good, but that look on Kaka's face says otherwise. Soon enough, everyone's enjoying the tasty takuan. After the meal, Yamaneko's target practice is cut short by Dancho calling for an emergency meeting. The cheerful leader just won't quit calling her Yamachan, but Yamaneko follows nonetheless. Especially after hearing the Excalibur appeared near a town called Greatfield, the others don't know this, but the place is connected to Yamaneko's past. That's why everyone's surprised to hear the unsociable Yamaneko take the initiative for once, volunteering for the mission. Dancho is ecstatic to be Yamaneko's partner, but Ruro needs to remind her it's his turn, not hers. As Yamaneko and Ruro head to their mission, Dancho stays at the headquarters, watching the footage from one of Greatfield's harvest festivals. Look at those adorable daikon girls dancing. Tekken's not about to be outdone. He loves dancing. Just check out the cool dance he does at their local festivals. It's so cool that Dancho wants to try it too, though Renkin tries her best to stop their leader from stripping. Meanwhile, Yamaneko, Ruro, and their fairies, Kupi and Bethor, finally arrive at Greatfield, where the Statue of Liberty Liberty Daikon is immediately visible from afar. To everyone's confusion, not a single townspeople are in sight when the whole town is supposed to be preparing for a festival. Yamaneko and Ruro split up to investigate, and Ruro instantly feels someone's presence. Things get much creepier when Yamaneko and Kupi find a crate of Daikon abandoned at the town plaza. Suddenly, a man and his daughter approach the plaza. Then bang! The little girl is sent flying by the bullet, turning into a Takuan with a poof before landing on the ground. As the father cradles his Takuan girl, a boy saves them with a staku and nunchaku. Yamaneko fires her rocket launcher at the sniper, giving everyone a chance to hide. Ruro points his gun at the kid, but Yamaneko and Kupi explain that the boy saved him and his weapon is not an Excalibur, just some good old takuan. Discovering Yamaneko and Ruro are the same travelers who defeated a dragon, the boy asks for them to lend their strength. He takes them to the town infirmary, where a bunch of takuans is resting. Yup, these are all townspeople. Loy says his older sister Loretta is out for revenge after an outsider won the Takuan contest, not their father. In her anger, Loretta ran away. If she had stayed, Loretta would have known what the townspeople found out. The woman switched the Takuans and promptly skipped town the night the truth was discovered. On the outskirts of town, Loretta found an Excalibur. She returns a year later, wielding a sniper rifle to stop the festival. All the poor townspeople in her range were hit, turning them into Takuans. Determined to help the town hold the festival, Yamaneko concocts a plan. Ruro and Bethor act as bait at the town plaza, while Yamaneko and Kupi search for Loretta. The sniper proves crafty, as Yamaneko and Kupi are tricked into going to the wrong location. As Ruro listens to Yamaneko's report, Loretta opens fire on the townspeople. Ruro and Lloyd do their best to defend everyone, but the Takuan lining the streets keeps piling up. In her worry, Yamaneko jumps into the plaza and directly into the sniper's line of fire. Yamaneko fails to fire back as she freezes, making Ruro run to her rescue. With one last valiant smile, Ruro falls to the ground as a Takuan. The shock of seeing her comrade turn into a tasty snack has Yamaneko firing furiously but failing to hit her target. At the infirmary, Loy apologizes for the trouble his family has caused. The mention of family has Yamaneko thinking back to her troubled past and the casualties of this mission. She has decided it's time Yamaneko handled this alone, as her lineage only brings others misfortune. But Kupi's a super lucky girl, the perfect companion for Yamaneko. With Kupi's help, Yamaneko confronts Loretta. 
aiming multiple hits at the statue's base. Loretta jumps down as the figure falls and faces Yamaneko in classic cowboy showdown fashion. But instead of revolvers, their showdown involves a rocket launcher and a sniper rifle. They jump and shoot at the same time, and as they land, Yamaneko falls to her knees. But she doesn't turn into a Takuan thanks to Bether's bulletproof Takuan vest. Loy enters the scene to stop his sister, and Yamaneko takes this chance to smack Loretta and destroy her Excalibur. Poof! Every Takuan people transforms back to normal. The next day, the whole town is buzzing with activity to prepare for the Harvest Festival. Loretta is remorseful and willing to take any punishment, but the townspeople are more than happy to welcome her back after her tearful apology. With their mission success, Yamaneko, Ruro, and their fairies return to the base. The next morning, Ruro's having a difficult time eating his breakfast. Can you blame the guy? He spent the better half of a day as a Takuan. Meanwhile, Yamaneko is in such a good mood that she eats the Takuan Dancho's feeding her, despite the leader calling her Yamachan yet again. After a successful day destroying Excaliburs, the squad retreats to their rooms that night for a much-needed rest. Except for Tekken. That guy's definition of rest is running up a hill at full speed. Kaka's disappointed by his fairy Bridget's tea-brewing skills. So fine, he'll just do it himself. On the way to the kitchen, Kaka sees the Panagia counter detecting an Excalibur. He immediately goes to Dancho's room to report this, only to find their mighty leader in an octopus costume fighting what looks like Slenderman Squid Edition. The next morning, Kaka goes off with Bridget to find and destroy the Excalibur. It's about time that unreliable leader learns how capable I am, is what Kaka says, but his tail is instantly between his legs after discovering that Excalibur's location is an all-girls school. But he can't turn back now, not with Dancho arriving at the scene, ready to infiltrate the school. For investigation's sake and the future safety, of course. Certainly not because Dancho loves to cosplay and be surrounded by super cute girls. No siree. We've got to give Dancho some credit despite her dubious ulterior motive. Not only does Dancho know Kaka's plan to find the Excalibur by himself, she also comes prepared with a uniform for Kaka. Ta-da! Kaka's now a trap. With some finishing touches from Bridget and Nukilavi, Kaka transforms into a tomboyish schoolgirl. With that, the four of them are ready to go on the undercover mission of their dreams. As his three companions, eagerly enter the school, Kaka attempts to leave while he still can. But what's this? A group of girls has Kaka already cornered. Sorry, Kaka, but there's really no turning back now. Dancho and the fairies easily blend in with the other girls, while Kaka tries to avoid attention at all costs. No dice, though, as the friendly girls flock to him. By the time half the day is over, Kaka's already exhausted. Thankfully, he just needs a few pats here and there, and voila! Kaka's ready to continue the day. With a face that cute, it's no wonder he's the talk of the school. Of course, Dancho takes the this opportunity to tease Kaka until he blushes mad. As he's deep in thought while walking down the hallway, Kaka bumps into a girl and they both fall on their bums in le cliché shoujo fashion. Kaka helps the girl Milia carry the canvases to the art club's room. After all, it's the least he can do after bumping into the president of the art club. While arranging the canvases, Kaka notices a sword handle sticking out. But it's not Excalibur, just a prop the club uses for drawing. In fact, they have dedicated storage space for these props. Unfortunately, Kaka doesn't get a chance to search for Excalibur as the art club members plead for him to model for them. Kaka gives in, thinking he'll just search for the Excalibur after he's done. He just didn't expect simply being stared at to be this embarrassing. On top of that, the club president has Kaka doing a bunch of cute poses to feed their creative appetite. That includes Kaka on his knees in a maid outfit, on all fours in a PE uniform, his shoulder exposed while saying meow, and a samurai pose with his legs spread apart. What part of all this is art? That's it. Kaka can't take anymore. But nope, there's no escaping the salacious, um, I mean, creatively starved ladies. Especially the most starved of them all, Milia the President, who happens to be wielding their target Excalibur. With a swish of the giant paintbrush that creates endless paint, Milia has Kaka trapped and sticking to the wall. The art club members take him to a storage room, where Milia can get what she wants to her heart's content, embarrassing a cute boy like Kaka until he's humiliated. That's right, Milia has known from the start. The crafty President even planned to bump into Kaka to ensure that Kaka's ample bust was fake. Now, Milia can watch all she wants as Kaka breaks. Of course, if he disobeys, she'll have no choice but to display his humiliating art at the exhibition. With the tip of the giant paintbrush, Milia tickles the tied-up Kaka, relishing every adorable protest from the cute boy. Not just her, but the entire club is enjoying this creative exercise. Kaka wonders why Milia's doing this, why she has this twisted kink. It all began when Milia was betrayed by her wonderful partner, who transformed from a cute little boy into a big scruffy man. On that day, Milia learned boys would eventually 
fatally betray her. And before that can happen, she'll capture them in their most beautiful form, a wall filled with BL art flashes as Milia passionately declares her kink. Thanks to her Excalibur, Milia can produce BL art as much as she wants for eternity. Now that she has been graced with the ideal model, aka Kaka, this is where the fun begins. Two women dressed as men enter the room in perfect ballet form while singing Shakespearean lines to embarrass the boy. Milia and the art club members rejoice at the display of deviance, with the president creating pages upon pages of art with a swish of her Excalibur. Just as Kaka lets out a tortured cry, Dancho and the fairies come busting into the rescue. Milia's not about to give up that easily, as she raises her Excalibur to face Dancho's sword. And they're down. That paintbrush isn't that mighty after all. Nuki Lavi and Bridget free Kaka, who releases a cute but scary bear to destroy Milia's Excalibur. As Milia weeps over her precious paintbrush, Dancho lectures her on fostering proper relationships instead of escaping into the world of deviance. Dancho, the call is coming from inside the house. Back in the base and in their normal clothes, Kaka discovers Dancho and the fairies chose to watch while he was facing a great crisis. To add insult to injury, Milia won first place in an art exhibition using her painting of Kaka. That's enough to get Kaka fired up and determined to burn down Milia's art, he calls for Bridget, only to notice she and Nukilavi are nowhere to be found. Where could they be? Yup, you guessed it, the fairies are still out enjoying their schoolgirl dream. Days filled with battles to destroy Excaliburs continue for the squad, until one day, the time has finally come. It's summer, and Operation Summer Fun Time is a go. Even the Arthurs tasked to destroy a million Excaliburs deserve a day of relaxation under the hot summer sun, that's why they've all convened at this lovely seaside resort. Well, all except three guys, it's just the girls today, exactly as Dancho likes it. As luck would have it, this seaside resort is near the Arthurs' headquarters, and they've all received a free pass to celebrate the grand opening. But it doesn't seem like it'll be all fun and games for them. Two girls get their swimsuits stolen right before their eyes. The master swimsuit thief is at the seaside resort. The thief can steal swimsuits without a trace. And soon enough, a horde of towel-clad girls complains to the resort staff. At this rate, the resort's reputation will plummet, and it may be forced to close. This master thief must be caught. And who better to handle this job than the Arthurs and their fairies? In Dancho's words, they're the perfect group of summer beauties. Surely they can lure the culprit with their charms. It's the ideal decoy plan. With that, they all split up to infiltrate any event the thief is likely to hit. First up is the popular idol swimming event. Yamaneko can't help but blush after spotting Utahime, her favorite idol, among the contestants. And at the mention of swimsuit slipping, Yamaneko's absolutely frothing at the mouth at the thought of Utahime in that situation. No, she simply can't let that thief expose the pure and innocent Utahime. So, it's time for Yamaneko, Kupi, and Nukilavi to infiltrate the pool cavalry battle and sniff out the culprit. But instead of the culprit, Yamaneko's looking for Utahime. Turns out the pop idol is here to sing. Who could have guessed? With the cavalry leader distracted, the swimsuit thief easily grabs several swimsuits, including Yamaneko's and the fairies. Meanwhile, Bridget and Tekken's fairy Tatiana spots a masked guy threatening a girl. That must be the thief. Tatiana hits him with a flying double sidekick, and Bridget follows up with a flame attack. That'll teach him, but nope. He's just a wrestler acting as the villain of the match. Oh dear, they just ruined a professional wrestling match. Dancho receives the reports, which makes her believe this swimsuit contest is the thief's sure target. Among the contestants are Bether, Renkin, and her fairy Bodak, who are too shy to show off their stuff. Sure enough, the master thief nabs the contestant's suits, though for some reason, Renkin and the fairies are skipped. Thanks to Dancho's observant eyes, she spots the thief and jumps to apprehend him, only to miss him by a hair's breadth. No problem, spotting the hook on one of the swimsuit tops is all Dancho needs to pinpoint the culprit's location. With that, the team convenes at a nearby spot filled with fishing enthusiasts. Of course, Dancho is quick to notice Yamachan's new one-piece suit. Hey, focus more on the task at hand and less on the swimsuit Yamaneko's rocking. Thankfully, Dancho spots an out-of-place man carrying a big basket. And yup, it's filled with swimsuit tops. Caught red-handed, the thief introduces himself as Sander, the angler Arthur, with a fishing rod as his Excalibur. Why would he use his powers for such a disgusting endeavor? Well, it's all for Sander's younger twin brother, Gaira, who suffered from poor health. Gaira's only wish is to have a star. Sander went on a journey to fulfill this wish, and that's when he found Excalibur. It's a touching story so far, but it's quite hard to believe when it's coming from a guy with a handful of swimsuits. But wait, there's more to this story. With all his might, Sander casts the line out into the sky, but all he can seem to do is fish out swimsuit tops. Despite this, Gyro was happy with his big brother's wholehearted effort. Just as the girls start to feel sorry for him, Sander finishes up the story by saying he got hooked ever since, and fishing out swimsuits is his hobby. Yup, depravity is his motivator in the end. In that case, there's no need to go easy on him. The girls launch a full frontal attack as Sander retaliates by taking their swimsuit tops. They soon attract quite a crowd, especially with all the topless girls gracing the swimsuit-less fishing ponds. 
the nerve of this thief. Dancha can't let the slimy man go unpunished for exposing everyone. In a head-to-head -head battle, Dancha manages to block the fishing line with her sword, only for Sander to flick the rod back to catch Dancha's top. Hook, line, and sinker. Not to worry, Renkin's gloves are here to the rescue, much to Dancha's delight. This gives the cheerful leader a perfect chance to land a powerful attack on Sander. As they tie up the master thief, it dawns on the girls how Sander only took swimsuit tops when the victims also had their bottoms stolen. This is when Sander reveals that there's more to his previous story. Gyra eventually got better, but ever since that night when he was buried under the pile of swimsuit tops, he had become a monster and craved more. With his own Excalibur fishing rod, Gyra specializes in fishing out bottoms in tandem with his big brother's specialization in swimsuit tops. Together, they're brothers in depravity. Well, isn't that a lovely story? That explains why girls in one-piece suits are safe from the brothers. Soon enough, Gyra locks on the multiple two-piece suits before him. Thinking fast, Yamaneko forms a cavalry with the one-piece suit girls just in time to shield their exposed leader. Using their combined Arthur attack, the cavalry girls send Gyra flying into the sky. With the case of the swimsuit thief solved, the girls can now go back to enjoy their time at the pool, spa, and gourmet food. Hopefully, this short summer relief isn't the calm before the storm for the Arthurs. With hundreds of thousands of Excaliburs left to destroy, it will take a lot of time and strength before they can declare the operation a success. The journey will surely get bumpy, but as long as they work together, there's nothing the Arthurs and their fairies can't overcome. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.